It's just truly a privilege to be able to speak with you today. Um, please be gracious with me if my words are not eloquent um, and I may stutter or stumble, but I do know that I feel like God has given me a word for this morning. Paul asked me to speak a couple of months ago on Father's Day, and ever since then there's been a stirring in my heart of a message that I know that is from God. It may be simple, it may not be um, fancy, but I know that it's true. And Pavel, I just want to thank you so much for always encouraging me and loving me as you do. You're an incredible husband and a wonderful father. Um, and to my own dad, it's a privilege, as Pavel said, to have you here today. A God-chosen father for me and me alone. And God knew what he was doing when he knit our hearts together. And I'm so grateful for all of the journey, the ups and the downs, the good moments and the difficult ones. But God knew and God has stayed constant and true. A couple of months ago, someone asked me, what is the greatest thing your father ever taught you? What is the greatest thing your father ever taught you? And without hesitation, my first response was, he taught me not to fear and not to be afraid. And though my life has been shaped by fear in so many reasons, because by nature, I'm just a fearful person. I worry about everything. But the father that God gave me taught me from a very young age to not fear, to stand when things look impossible and to keep going on. I remember one particular moment, I was maybe nine or 10, we were at the city pool and we were swimming in the pool and there was short diving boards and there was high diving boards and little old me was so scared of that high diving board. And my dad said, Haley, you can do it, go for it. So my little wobbly knees climbed the ladder, got to the top and like, I'm not doing this. Climbed right back down the ladder. And he's like, Haley, don't be afraid. You go up there and you do it. So I climbed back up the ladder, went to the edge this time. What was eight feet looked like 500 feet because now it's not the surface of the water but you see all the way down to the bottom of the pool. I then went back down the thing, back down the ladder. I'm like, I am not doing this. At this time, the whistles of the pool, everyone's blowing, the lifeguards are like, the pool's closing. My dad's like, you're going up the ladder and you're jumping down the height. No, daddy, daddy, don't make me, I don't wanna go. But sure enough, I finally did, maybe the third, fourth, fifth time, I'm not sure how many tries it was. I climbed back up the ladder with my father cheering me on. You will do this. You will face this little fear because if you face this fear, you will face all the ones that are yet to come in your life. Because if we don't face our fears, if we don't climb the ladders, if we don't look off the, the scaffolding of the diving board and just know that it's just water and we can trust it, not only can we trust it, but we can trust our Father who's cheering us on, say, I know, I've done it before. I've jumped off high dives. I've jumped into places that have uncertainly, but do not be afraid. And I'm happy to say that day that I jumped off the diving board with all the little kids looking at me, the lifeguard staring at me, and my Father cheering me on. And I'm so glad, Daddy, that you encouraged me to jump off that high dive because there's been many other times in my life where I've had to look at fear and face it head on by the mercy and grace of God. For the past few months, we've been challenged as a church to do the Bible reading plan. Who's been doing it? Don't raise your hands. I've been doing it. Well, most part I've been doing it, if I'm honest. I do it the best that I can with three small children and life's responsibilities. But because of that Bible reading plan, I keep finding myself in the Old Testament and loving it, loving those stories. And I spoke not too long ago here and I, I spoke a message called Beware of the Hunger Pains. And it was talking about when the Israelites were led into that place of deliverance and into freedom, how their hunger pains tripped them up, how they forgot the miraculous provision of God because they got hungry and they wanted to go back to Egypt to just have some meat. They wanted to go back to captivity because their deliverance became uncomfortable. And how many times can we say in our lives, God brings us into deliverance and places of freedom but we get uncomfortable there. It's a little bit scary, it's uncertain. We don't know that the manna from heaven is gonna fall from the sky and we want to go back to what was familiar. And I wanna pick up with, with the story of the Israelites and I'm sorry to, to bring them up again, but I feel like maybe I'm finding myself with this group of people because I think there's so much that we can relate to with these Israelites 
God's chosen people that he supernaturally delivered, brought them out of Egypt, placed them on a journey, but he brought them out of deliverance for a destination. He didn't just deliver them to play games with their lives. He delivered them because he had a destination and a promised land in mind. If you have your Bibles this morning, you can turn to Exodus chapter three. I'm gonna read from verse seven through 10. Exodus chapter three, verse seven through 10. And it says, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their sufferings. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Pezrasites, Hevizites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of Israel has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, Moses, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So God sees his people, his chosen people, the people that he loves. He hears them. And what does it say? It says, I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land and into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And what does God do? He does what only he can do. He faithfully and supernaturally delivers these people. And we know the story, the miraculous plagues fall upon the Egyptians. He parts the Red Sea. He destroys their enemy and he provides for them in the wilderness. He provides for them in the wilderness. And as I said earlier, Israel was delivered with a destination in mind. He had a purpose to their deliverance and it was to bring them into a land that was promised That was a land flowing with milk and honey and provision, a good and spacious place for his people to flourish and grow. And it says in the Bible that approximately after two years of them wandering in the wilderness, God comes to Moses and says, send 12 leaders, one from each tribe of Israel and send them into the promised land, send them into the land that I have prepared for you. So 12 leaders from the tribe are chosen and they go to spy out the promised land. And I found that so unique because when you look throughout the Bible, there's not many times that God gives his people a preview of what is to come for them. Most of the time it's just walk by faith, follow me moment by moment, step by step. But in this instance, Maybe it's because he knew the people just needed to see. Maybe he knew their hearts of complaining, the ups and downs that they had faced. Maybe he knew that they were beginning to doubt what the whole point of this whole thing was all about. Can you imagine two years of your life in a wilderness? God, you delivered me. Yes, you saved me from my enemies. Yes, you are providing supernatural manna from heaven. Yes, thank you, I praise you, God but what is the point of all of this? Have you ever felt like that in your own life? God has brought victory. He's brought you into places of deliverance. He set you free, but all of a sudden, the everydayness of life is hot, uncomfortable, uncertain, and you begin to question, God, what is the purpose of this? At least in Egypt, I had a job. At least in Egypt, I had something to do. At least in Egypt, I knew what the next day was gonna be. But God, this wilderness, it doesn't make sense. God, this wilderness, is this really your plan? Have you been there or is it just me that has questions like that? So I believe that God knew their hearts. He heard their murmurings and complaining. And he said, you know what? I'm gonna give you a preview of what is to come. So these 12 men go into the promised land and it says they were there for 40 days. They went up the promised land, back down through the promised land. They were given the directive to spy out the land, to see what was there. And it says it in Numbers 13, verse two. Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. For each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders, So at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out of the desert. All of them were the leaders of Israel. 
So 12 leaders go to spy out this land. They spend 40 days there. They look at the fruit. They look at the soil. They take investigation of the cities. They size up the people. And for 40 days, they wander around this promise of God. Oh, the things they must have thought because the wilderness was dry, hot. All they had to eat was manna and some quail. But in this promised land, they saw fruit and honey and trees and people and places of establishment. They saw the things that their very heart longed for in this 40 day preview of a promised land. They saw the things that they really wanted deep down inside that they thought maybe Egypt would offer some measure of it. But in this preview of the promised land, they saw all the things that they had longed for and wanted and maybe even actually needed and thought that they deserved. But it said when the, when the 12 came back, oh, the report that they gave. 12 chosen men, leaders in the nation of Israel got the special appointment of seeing the promises of God that was gonna come for the entire nation. And what do they do? Let's read. In Numbers 13, 26, they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Perna. There they reported to them in the whole assembly and showed them the fruit. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit, here is the proof. But the people who live there are powerful. The cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites and the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites live in the hill country and the Canaanites live in the sea along the Jordan. So these 12 men, after their journey, come back and give this report. They showed the fruit. They confirmed the fact that it was a land flowing with milk and honey. But, they said, the people and the cities are fortified and huge. They even have giants in the land. And I can just imagine how they felt in that moment as the entire nation of Israel is gathered, 12 leaders stand before them and say, yes, this land that God has promised us, it has fruit. There is milk, there is honey, but the cities are huge. They're fortified and there are giants in the land. And it's like they were saying, God, that's a really nice place. And yeah, it has some of the things you talked about, the things, God, that you promised us but it's impossible to conquer that land. Nice plan, God. Yeah, it's a good place, but there's no way we will ever defeat those giants. And I can just imagine all of a sudden the crowds of the Israelites gathered, these 12 men declaring to them the impossibility of that land, of that promise ever being theirs. Can you imagine how the Israelite nation must have felt? We've been wandering for two years. We finally get to see a glimpse. We send in 12 of our leaders to just get a glimpse of the things that God has promised us. And the report that they come back with, yeah, it's fantastic. The land is incredible. There's all the things you could ever imagine or want, but the giants are too big. The cities are too large. The walls are too high. Can you imagine the defeat they must have felt? Do you ever feel like that in your own life where God's like, I want you to go and do this. I'm calling you to step out in faith here. I'm saying to you, do not be afraid, go forward. I have a plan and a purpose for your life. But then you face giants, but then you hit walls. And what happens? We're humans, we get disappointed, we get discouraged. All of a sudden we're so aware of our own weaknesses and fr- frailties. We're just a wandering people with just a little bit of manna. How could we ever occupy the promised land? And it breaks my heart that these 12 men give that report, that they allowed fear and doubt to overrule what God had already given them. 
You see, God already gave them and told them, this land is your land. I am giving it to you to possess, to inherit it. It's not just for you, but it's for all the generations to come. But what did these men do? They come back and all they see is their own insecurities. I can't do it. We can't do it. There's no way. There's no way. And have you ever heard those voices? It's not possible. It's too much. The walls in my own life are too high. The enemy is too big. The situation is impossible to change. But there was one man with one voice out of the 12. And it says, that Caleb stepped forth and he silenced the people. He silenced the doubt. He silenced the voices. He silenced the people, an entire nation, 11 leaders behind him. And he steps forward in an impossible situation. And he says, you know what? I saw what you saw. I see what you see but I spy something possible. And I believe that we're called to have a spirit like Caleb that would rise up in this generation, not only for our family, but for those yet to come and say, you know what? I see it. I see the giants. I see the walls. I see the places of impossibility. I know my own weakness. I know my own frailties. I know I don't have the weapons of defense. I know I only get a little bit of mana. I know I don't have the strength to go on, but we're called to be as Caleb. I see what you see, but I spy something possible because it's already been given to me. It's already been promised. I've already been given this land. It is mine to possess, it is my inheritance. We are to have the spirit of Caleb no matter what we feel, no matter what we see. Yes, there's walls, yes, there's giants, but I serve a God who does the impossible and all things are possible in him. And as Josh Caleb rises up in that moment, I can only imagine the hush that went over the people as he silenced them. And he literally said one line. He just said, would you believe? I know that it's possible. And in that moment, in that hush of a moment, when that one voice is louder than all of the rest, that one voice that says, yes, I see, but I know what's impossible can be possible with my God. And Caleb stands in the midst of all those people in quietness. And I think there was like a moment of reckoning for the Israelites. Maybe that quiet lasted for five, 10, 15 minutes, because I think they needed to ponder. They needed to consider all the things that Moses had already spoken to them They knew they were delivered with a destination in mind. God never kept that a secret from them. When God called them out of Egypt, he told them, I'm taking you out to take you to a spacious and good land. I have a plan for your life. They knew that. And they let the preview and 11 men cost them 38 more years in the wilderness. They had just been wandering for two years Maybe it felt like an eternity, but in that moment, it was just two years. But because they didn't listen to Caleb, it cost them 38 more years of wandering in a wilderness, a whole generation not being able to see and walk in the promised land that was rightfully theirs because they doubted instead of believing. They chose to say it's not possible instead of looking to a God and saying, I know it's possible in him. In Numbers 13, 31 through 33, it says, but the men who had gone up with Caleb said, we can't attack these people. They are stronger than we are. And they are spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devour those living in it. All the people we saw there are giant in size. 
We have the nymphum, the descendants of a knack. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. So these 12 men come in with a bad report. The silence in Caleb's one-line sermon saying, I spy something possible. After that moment of silence and hush, then these men rise up again and one more time spread a bad report throughout Israel. And it's shocking to me because they saw the enemy stronger than they were, even though God had just split the Red Sea and devoured their enemies. They said this land devour all those things living in it, though they had just testified of its fruitfulness and the fact that it was flowing with milk and honey. And then they even started to exaggerate and they said, they made things worse. They said, all the people are giant in size. Every last one of them are too big for us. And we do that so many times, we begin to doubt the truth about who God says we are. You see the Israelites as we are, are a chosen people. They are delivered, they are loved, they are cherished, they are defended, and they are a people provided for. Why is it? And how is it that we lose sight of God and who God says we are? How do we do that? Why do we do that? I do that so many times in my life. God has given me promises and reassurance, but I get scared and I get uncertain and I begin to doubt. And I wanna remind you of something this morning. We cannot be a people with a grasshopper view of ourselves. We are not called to be a people who see ourselves as grasshoppers. If you see yourself as a grasshopper, it will not go well with you. You will be stepped on, you will be pushed aside, you will be wallowing in defeat all the days of your life if you see yourself as a grasshopper. But we must be like Caleb and say, I'm not a grasshopper. I am called, I am chosen, and I spy something possible in the mighty name of God. And I think sometimes when the enemy raises his head at us and the voices are so loud, and the thing in the promised land that he's called you to, the plans and the purposes he has for your life, you have a choice. The difficulties that you face in your marriage, the waywardness of your children, the uncertainty of tomorrow. You can either look at yourself as a grasshopper or you can look up and say, I know my weaknesses. I know my frailties. I know that I don't know the full path forward, but I know my God and I know that he's faithful. I know that he's good. I know that he's true. I know that what he said he will do, he will complete in me. I don't know all the steps. I don't know how it's gonna happen, but I spy something possible because I'm not gonna doubt the promises of God. I'm not gonna allow fear to dictate my life. I'm gonna go in and I'm not gonna squander 38 years of my life because I got scared. And I believe for all of us here today, it's a call that God is saying, what do you see? And what do you do with what you see? When you keep arguing in your home, when you're angry, when your marriage is barely hanging on with a thread, those things you see, they're real. The pain you feel, it's real. But, but, we're called to be that one voice in the midst of our storms, in the midst of our journey and said, but God, by your grace and mercy, I spy something possible because all things are held in your hand. All things that you have given are mine to behold. And I don't have to live in fear and in defeat. I can walk in by faith to the promises that God has for my life. The promises is that you have peace, you have love, you have joy, you have self-control, you have hope. Yeah, I see what I see. I look at myself in the mirror every day 
and I see what I see. But I know by the grace and mercy of God, all things are possible in him. We must have that kind of faith to not look at ourselves, to not look at the giants, to not see the fortified walls of our life of bitterness, pain and unforgiveness. Because in a moment of time, all things can be made new. Those walls can fall down. That compassion can come. That forgiveness can be yours. That mercy for your spouse, that gentle word upon your tongue, it's possible. And I don't know where you're going. And I don't know where each one of you is called to. I don't know where you're at in the promised land, whether you're just previewing or you're walking it out. But I pray that a faith rises up in you, that when you see the impossibility, you're not gonna look at yourself like a grasshopper. You're gonna look at yourself as a son and daughter of a king who has called you by name to do what he has asked you to do, to stand in hard places, to trust him for the miraculous, to trust him that he will defeat the enemies, to trust him that the walls will come down, even if it's just brick by brick by brick. Will you trust him if it's just brick by brick by brick? Will you trust him if it's just step by step by step? Will we? when it's so hard that you just wanna go back to Egypt because at least it was familiar, at least it had certainty, at least it was what I knew. But God is saying, no, I have delivered you for a purpose. I have called you and delivered you for a destination. And it's not to go back and it's not to stay in the wilderness. It's to go into the full promises of God for your life, the fullness of them to believe them that says, yes, I know who I am, but I know who my God is. Yes, I see giants, but I see, and I know that those giants fall. Yes, I see the walls, but by the mercy and grace of God, brick by brick by brick, they will fall. And may we be a people for ourselves, for our family, for this generation, Though 11 others go with us, though the voices of a nation are so loud saying, we can't go in, let's just go back. Can we be and have the spirit of Caleb and saying, by the grace and mercy of God, we can occupy this land. We will be victorious. We will see freedom. And not only for ourselves, but for our children and our children's children. Can I tell you something right now? Life is not about you. And sometimes we need to get over ourselves. We spend so much time focusing on ourselves, our comforts, our own needs, all of our fears, our insecurities, but life is not about us. And we truly need to get over ourselves and understand that I have been made and called for this moment in time. And it's to love, it's to see, it's to cherish. It's to believe when no one else does, when 11 others say it's not possible. Will you and I be the one that said, because I spy something possible in him and in him alone. You see, the possible isn't contingent upon you and me. Thank God. The possible is all on his shoulders. It's on that cross. It's what he's already done for you and I. It's what he's already said is rightfully ours. So let's move on. Let's move in to the thing that God has called us to. Let's live in the everydayness of life supernaturally. Supernaturally, God, give me the eyes to see my neighbor. Give me a word of compassion for the lost. Let me turn off my television. Let me invite people to my dinner table because you can go on as life as usual. You can live in the familiar. You can have just enough meat if you want it. But I want supernatural manna from heaven. I wanna see my enemies defeated. I wanna walk into a place that is flowing with milk and honey and the fullness of what God has for my life. And I know that you want the same. And it can be so overwhelming it can be so overwhelming, I get that. But can we start with God? I don't know how you're gonna do it. 
I don't know why you're asking me to do it. But God, I spy and I see something possible in you because God entrusts much to those who trust him. He will entrust so much in your life if you would but trust him. Trust him for your marriage. Trust him for your children. Trust him for yourself. Trust him. He will not fail you, I promise. If you heard nothing else this morning, he will not fail you. Amen. Let us stand and we're gonna worship the Lord. Father, we come before you this morning. And God, you know our weaknesses. You know our fears and our doubts. You see us. And God, this morning we look to you and we ask, oh God, that we would place wholeheartedly our trust in you, that we would not fear the places that you've called us to, that we would stand firm in our faith and our trust in you. God, that no matter what we see, no matter what we've seen, God, we're gonna choose to take you at your word. We're gonna to choose to believe that you've always already promised us life and life abundantly. You've promised to give us a new mind and a new spirit. You've promised God to never leave us nor forsake us. You promised that you would stick closer than a brother. You've promised that if we but ask, you will supply every need that we will ever have. You promised, oh God, that you would be our strength and our portion. And so God, this morning, by faith, we choose to trust you. And God, I pray all the days of our life would not be ordinary, but we'd be extraordinary in you. God, in the everyday places that you've called us, may we live supernaturally. God, not believing what others say, not believing the thoughts and the lies in our own minds and hearts, but God, despite how we feel and despite what we see, we look to you where our help comes from. God, we love you this morning. And I pray that this word find its way in our hearts and you would increase our trust in you.